this is the two minute warning. Good afternoon, I'm Mandy Cohen. I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services for North Carolina, and I'm joined today by Director of Emergency Management, Mike Spayberry. Karen Magoon and Cameron Larson are our American Sign Language interpreters, and working behind the scenes are our Spanish translators, Jackie and Jasmine Metevier. I'll start with a rundown of the numbers. As of this morning, there were 64,670 laboratory confirmed cases, 908 people currently hospitalized, and sadly, there have been 1,343 deaths. Since the start of the pandemic, we have worked hard to protect those at high risk of serious complications from COVID-19. Older North Carolinians have been hard hit by this virus and residents of long-term care facilities are particularly vulnerable. Early on, we formed a long-term care team of, for COVID-19 response dedicated to working with facilities, local health departments, industry associations, advocacy groups, hospitals, and others on a multi-pronged strategy of prevention, capacity, testing, and managing outbreaks and oversight. Given the risks, the governor took aggressive preventive measures beginning back in March with restricting visitation and communal activities and requiring employees to be screened and monitoring of residents. We also paid for and delivered to all of our state licensed long-term care facilities a 14-day supply of personal protective equipment to support facilities as they built up their own PPE supply networks. And we've provided temporary rate increases to help them meet the enhanced COVID-19 infection protocols. We've also helped facilities address staffing shortages by providing temporary workers from the state and provided ongoing training and assistance on infection prevention and control measures. In our oversight role, the Department of Health and Human Services is surveying all nursing homes on infection control. Testing is also a key part of our strategy. Currently, all residents and staff are tested when there is one case of COVID in a long-term care setting. We also have begun proactive testing of all staff and residents in nursing homes. 
We have completed this proactive testing in all state-run skilled nursing facilities, and beginning next week, DHHS, Health and Human Services, will pay for and deploy proactive testing of staff and residents in all private nursing homes. We are announcing today that DHHS is partnering with CVS Omnicare for one-time COVID-19 testing of all residents and all staff in nursing homes across North Carolina. This effort will extend through the middle of August and reach an estimated 36,000 residents and 25,000 staff in over 400 nursing homes in the state. This testing will provide another tool to further protect those who are at higher risk. While we continue to expand testing, it is important to note that commercial and hospital labs across the country, including here in North Carolina, are again running into shortages of important chemicals called reagents that are needed to process tests. As a result, labs are seeing backups in processing samples and are taking longer to provide results. Federal action is needed to help address these supply issues. The, par the department's work is only part of the equation. Everyone needs to play their part to protect their health and the health of our loved ones and our neighbors, including those older North Carolinians, by wearing a face covering. Face coverings are effective when everyone wears them, which is why we took the important step of requiring them in public spaces. Many people who have COVID-19 don't show any symptoms right away. You may have the virus right now and not know it. When you wear a face covering, you protect others around you. That could be someone who works in a nursing home who also happens to shop at your local grocery store or eats at your favorite restaurant. By protecting them, they are less likely to catch the virus and risk spreading it to those they care for in nursing homes. This is so important because we know that once the virus finds its way into a nursing home, it can spread rapidly with devastating consequences for residents. Additionally, as you think ahead to this July 4th weekend, make sure you are planning for ways to celebrate that involve wearing a face covering, avoiding large crowds, and washing your hands often. We need to keep this virus from spreading further. States like Arizona, Texas, Florida, and others are cautionary tales that show us this virus can surge and surge quickly. Our measured approach here in North Carolina is, help, is helping to protect all North Carolinians. We don't want to go backwards, and we won't need to if we work together on the three W's, wear, wait, and wash. Please continue to take care of yourself and those around you. And with that, I'll turn it over to Director Mike Spraybray. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And good afternoon. Today is day 113 of the State Emergency Operations Center's COVID-19 response. I'm taking this opportunity to thank local health directors and emergency managers. We appreciate your hard work. Since Secretary Cohen has been discussing long-term care facilities, I want to share some numbers from the PPE distribution we recently completed to more than 3,800 long-term care facilities across the state. Items provided to long-term care homes included more than 1.5 million procedural masks, 6.7 million gloves, 649,000 face shields, 607,000 shoe covers, along with supplies of hand sanitizer. Adult care homes, family care homes, nursing care homes, intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities and mental health facilities received these supplies and many told us how grateful they were to get them. We thank our partners from the National Guard and Civil Air Patrol as well as the local emergency managers who help plan and operate these distribution points. There are still 274 National Guard members with 59 vehicles activated for the COVID-19 response, supporting everything from feeding operations, planning, cyber protection, 
warehousing, and transportation. We thank these men and women for their outstanding service. As we move deeper into hurricane season, we're pleased to announce that FEMA and the North Carolina Department of Public Safety have approved a state-operated hazard mitigation grant program. The plan focuses on buying out or elevating storm-flooded homes utilizing available hazard mitigation funded awarded to state after Hurricanes Florence and Dorian, as well as Tropical Storm Michael. The intent of the program is for the state to take on more of the contract management using area contractors to do both acquisition and elevation work, which will ease the administrative burden on our counties with a goal of delivering relief to disaster survivors quicker. Yesterday, we requested the FEMA Crisis Counseling Regular Services Program which will provide expanded crisis counseling during the pandemic. Back on June 15th, we received notice that FEMA had granted the state's request for immediate crisis counseling services with a $1.5 million grant to expand Hope for North Carolina counseling program. This next phase of support that we've requested will allow us to further expand crisis counseling and support services for those struggling during the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember, the Hope for NC helpline is 1-855-587-3463. Again, 1-855-587-3463. You can call day or night for support. We've also requested another one-month extension for the FEMA non-congregate sheltering program. Counties that are using that program now to shelter more than 1,100 people in hotels who need isolation or quarantine to stop the spread of the virus. We plan to continue this program as long as it's available and needed. The state emergency response team is still aggressively pushing PPE to hospitals, long-term care facilities, first responders, and others on a daily basis. Just yesterday, we delivered PPE to 59 counties and one health care preparedness coalition. We also received 155 requests for PPE. These are busy times for our sourcers, purchasers, warehouse teams, and drivers, and we thank them so much for their great work. The CERT team continues to identify both non-congregate and congregate shelters for hurricane season 2020. We want our residents in hurricane and flood prone areas to know the best plan in case of a required evacuation this year is to stay with family or friends at a safe place inland or at a hotel. A shelter will not be your best option in the COVID-19 environment. Lastly, Let's remember to observe the three W's. Wear a cloth face covering, wait at least six feet apart, and wash your hands often. Like Secretary Cohen says, wear, wait, and wash. It's scientifically proven. This is how we slow the spread of the virus, by working collectively together. As always, don't forget to look out for your family, friends, and neighbors, and to call your loved ones daily. Guaranteed they'll appreciate it. With kindness and cooperation, we will all get through this together as one team, one mission, and one family. Now back to Madam Secretary for questions and answers. Terrific. Well, thank you, Director Sprayberry. And with that, we'll open for questions. Our reporters on the line, we remind you to press one if you have a question, and then five if you have a follow up. We'll take our first question from Jody McCreary at CBS 17. Uh, yes, Dr. Cullen, I wanted to ask, we're looking at some of the, the percentage, the share of, of deaths uh, of them involving nursing homes, and that's gone down over the past month. I don't know if you could sort of explain, are, are nursing homes doing anything better now? What improvements have you seen being made in, in sort of how nursing homes are handling COVID-19? Sorry, I you were a little garbled there, so maybe we'll try again. I, something about death rates. Just, I apologize, I didn't catch the second half. Uh, looking for the the share of of deaths uh, in in nursing homes over the past month has has gone down compared to the total number of deaths. Uh, 
I was wondering if there was an explanation for that. Are they doing something better? Uh, have there been improvements made? What do you attribute the, uh, I guess, the improvements uh, in the nursing home situation to? So thanks for that question. And so I, I think what we were asking is that you're seeing the, the percentage of deaths from nursing homes go down relative to others. And what you heard me talk about today was the importance of all of the things that we're doing to protect folks in our long-term care settings, including nursing homes, um, and that we're going to be doing even more proactive testing. We've been working to protect uh, folks for a very long time. They are at some of our most vulnerable and high-risk folks. They're medically frail. We know this virus is more vicious to those that are over the age of 75. I was looking at studies today that show that, the unfortunately, the mortality rate, meaning the death rate in folks that are over 75, is something between 15 and 17 percent. So we know how important it is to t protect our older uh, folks here in, in North Carolina when they're in a nursing home or not. Um, but as far as the the percentage going down is the total. I think what that is as a is related to is the fact that we are seeing more virus spread in our community. And when you have more cases of COVID-19 in community, that means you're going to have more hospitalizations and unfortunately more folks who may succumb to to this virus. And so as a as a percentage of the total, it may just be that we're seeing spread in other places. I would encourage folks in, I, on, on death rates in particular, these are things that can, can move around from day to day, week to week, even month to month, and, and is often something that you need to look back on after we've, we've gone through a period of time to really understand uh, the, the trends in our death rates because they are what's called a lagging indicator. It is, like, it is lagging even behind hospitalizations, which we know is a, what we also call a lagging indicator. So it sometimes gives us a picture of maybe what was happening about a month ago um, as opposed to what is happening right in this moment. But what we are seeing across our state in terms of cases is more viral spread in our communities outside of long-term care settings. Yes, that was a big part of what we were seeing in April um, and even in early May. But what we're seeing now is more spread in our communities, which unfortunately means more hospitalizations and, and folks uh, succumbing to the, the virus who are outside of these settings, which is my, uh, why we may be seeing uh, that, that death percentage look differently from our long-term care settings. I think it's also because we've been working very, very hard, uh, as you said, to protect folks in long-term care. It is a top priority for us. So I think both of those things in combination. Thank you. Our next question is from Victoria Bulabasis with Enlace Latino MP. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, my question is for Director Sprayberry. And it's about the emergency alert system ahead of a hurricane. Um, my understanding is that the national alert originates with the National Weather Service and the FCC, and that it is available in Spanish and other languages. So I'm wondering what is the state's plan um, for delivering these Spanish language alerts ahead of a hurricane, and which counties you've decided will get those types of alerts? So alerts are done at the county level. But uh, we have a program called Know Your Zone, which folks at the, in our coastal counties, it's a new program, a new initiative, and it is in both English and Spanish language. We also have done all of our documentation uh, relative to hurricane evacuation and hurricane preparedness. That's also in English and Spanish. And again, I can tell you that uh, for alerts, that's normally done by the counties and they're the ones that issue the alerts for the residents and visitors uh, in their county, uh, not the state. Thank you. Our next question is from Matt Mercer at the North State Journal. Hey, Matt Mercer, hey. North State Journal. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, yesterday, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Forrest, during his uh, press conference regarding the lawsuit he's filing about uh, the Emergency Management Act, he said that both Governor Cooper and uh, Dr. Cohen have stated they currently have statutory authority relating to the Emergency Management Act to enact these orders. Uh, can you please cite that specific uh, statute as it currently states that it needs uh, concurrence from the Council of State? And my second question is, uh, 
maybe for Dr. Cohen or Director Sprayberry, there was a call made back in March for retired and possibly out-of-state personnel um, to be used to handle a surge capacity. And then also uh, the field hospitals that were used are no longer uh, requested or in operation. Is there a chance those would be brought back if necessary, or is there still existing capacity within the hospitals to handle any sort of uh, increase um, from where the current hospitalization numbers are? Well, thanks, Matt, for that question. Let me start with uh, the authority question you asked. I'm not the lawyer, and I can't cite a statute for, for, for you uh, off the cuff, but I'm happy to have lawyers follow up with you on that, and I'm sure lawyers will work through those details. I think the important thing is to know that the governor and I have been thinking about taking early and aggressive action to protect the people of North Carolina. And I think what you've seen since the end of March is our ability to slow the spread of this virus and build up our capabilities to respond and take a slow and measured response in easing restrictions to try to find that balance between protecting public health and reigniting the economy. And I think what you, we are seeing as cautionary tales from other uh, states around us where they're seeing surges of cases, we're seeing increases, and that is concerning to me, but we're not seeing surges. And to your second question about hospital capacity, we have it, and that's a good thing. And we want to preserve it, and we don't want to get anywhere near overwhelming our health care system. So we're taking the measured approach uh, based on science and data to help us understand how we can protect North Carolinians and also find the balance to reigniting our economy. I think they go hand in hand. So as far as authority, I, I know that our department has an, what's called an imminent hazard authority. If we see, feel that something is an imminent threat to public health, that we are able to, uh, to actually act and intervene. Uh, so I think all the things that you see us doing to take these actions to protect the people of North Carolina are incredibly important. Um, and I think it has borne out in the data we have seen thus far that our, our slow and measured approach has allowed us to be able to keep the virus level low. But what we are starting to see is those increases in trends, slight increases in hospitalizations. But we can, our fate is not sealed. We have the power, all of us, to keep the virus level low. That's why we went forward with a statewide requirement related to face coverings. We want everyone to work hard together on this. And I'd remind us that one of the important things we want to do is get our kids back to school uh, for in-person instruction. But we have to do, be able to do that safely. Um, and so working together to keep that virus level low is, is important. On your second question related to hospitalizations, again, uh, yes, we do currently have hospital capacity. We work very closely with our hospital systems. Uh, we are in touch with them daily to make sure we understand what is happening, tracking uh, what is happening in the hospitals right along with them. Uh, and making sure we don't ever want to be in a place where we have to go to a field hospital. That is incredibly uh, uh, challenging to, I will say, as a physician, uh, to, to think about caring for folks in a hospital-like setting that is not actually a hospital. Um, that would be a dire circumstance that we would be in, and we want to prevent that. And we have the ability to do that. We each have the power to stop the spread of this virus. So we're gonna focus on that while we also plan to make sure that we have the surge capacity needed. We've been working for many months on surge planning. Uh, Director Sprayberry may wanna add more on, on some of our contingency plans, but they are there, but I, want, I don't wanna to have to use them. So thank you, Madam Secretary. And first of all, uh, General Statute 166A does um, guide us when we are going through an emergency. And I, one thing that I do know while I'm not a lawyer, and I can't s cite every single statute uh, within that law, I know that whenever um, Madam Secretary and the governor take uh, actions under 166A, if it's appropriate, uh, they get approval from the Council of State. And, um, and if not, then they make the decisions that are required to make sure that uh, public safety and um, public health are insured. Regarding uh, medical surge, I wanna tell you that every day we look at medical surge capability, our capacity, that's not once in a while, that's every day. And we just don't look at numbers. Uh, we get those numbers and like Madam Secretary said, 
Uh, we're in discussions with the hospitals to make sure that we have a very deep and granular understanding of what those numbers mean. So uh, right now we do have the capacity. We've also got a great uh, state disaster medical system which is made up of uh, eight uh, state medical assistance teams. We have a mobile disaster hospital. So we have a lot of capacity out there. Um, they're tried and true. We've used them in many different disasters. We've also uh, basically deployed them to other states uh, whenever they have emergencies. So these are folks that know what they're doing. So I've, we feel pretty good about it. But that's not saying that we're taking our eye off the ball. We're watching it very carefully very closely to make sure that uh, we understand what our capacity is at all times, and I mean at all times. So thank you very much for those questions. Ma'am? Our next question is from Jonathan Alexander at the News and Observer. Hi, Dr. Cohen, this is Jonathan Alexander with the News and Observer. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, contact uh, about contact tracing. What percentage of people are not reporting their contacts to tracers? And in what county? In what counties are doubling times contracting? And what's the source of viral spread there? And also, wh what do you think is the biggest reason North Carolina has continued to see an increase in cases in hospitalizations? Um, is it lack of mass mass gatherings? Well, Jonathan, thanks for that. I'm not sure I caught the end there, but let me start with um, what what do I think is driving? I think you asked what are the source of spread? What do we think is driving uh, infection? So I think there are a number of places in which we see uh, that viral spread. Um, mass gatherings, as you mentioned at the end, is one of those places that are at the highest risk of, of spreading the infection. There are also some high risk um, occupations that we know are, are sources of spread of the infection, uh, some in the meatpacking industry, our agricultural sector, so some of our, our farming communities, manufacturing, construction, um, those are some of the places and we're seeing workplace spread of, of this virus, but it starts in those workplaces, but also then gets into the communities that those folks live in. Um, we are also seeing spread, obviously, in our some of our long-term care facilities. We post that every uh, on, on our website of where those uh, th that spread is, which is why we're focused on protecting folks in our long-term care settings and why we're doing additional testing uh, that we're announcing today. As far as contact tracing, this is work that we have been ramping up. It's something that our local health departments did before COVID-19. Um, and I think that we, we have seen, similar to around the country, contact tracing is challenging. One, folks have to pick up the phone um, and have to be willing to work with us. And that is one of our key messages is to pick up the phone. If you see folks are calling you from your local health department or it says NC COVID team, uh, please pick up the phone because folks are trying to get in touch with you to say, you you may have been exposed um, and to talk through uh, what to do if you have had that exposure. Um, so I think contact tracing is ramping up um, and I think there is county to county variation because there are different levels of cases in some of our counties where we're seeing higher number of cases. Certainly we're trying to surge resources and people to those places, um, but that we still have work to do to make sure we have enough people to be able to get to all of our new cases each and every day and then make contact. But we know there's a lot of challenges to picking up the phone and wanting people to work with us. So we have to work on that communication and that trust, and we're gonna to continue to do that. Thank you. We have a follow-up from Jonathan Alexander at the News and Observer. Hey, as a, as a follow-up, almost half the cases in North Carolina are now with people ages 25 to 49. Are they the new age group that we need to focus on? And, and what kind of messaging do you have for people um, that age who may not take COVID-19 seriously or nor wear a mask um, or go out to large gatherings? 
Jonathan, thanks for bringing that up. Yes, we've been talking about since over the last two weeks, we have seen that the majority of our new cases are in a younger cohort, age 18 to 49. Um, that's where the majority of the cases are. We think that's likely a combination of folks um, who need to go out to work um, and are in ex exposed settings, but also that you know when you're younger, you feel more invincible um, and you don't think, well, if I get it, I get it, and it's not gonna harm anyone. But that's actually the wrong way of looking at this. When we see more spread in our, our, our younger folks who may not get quite as sick, they are still risks to those that would get more sick. They may have lunch with their, their older parent or grandparent, a friend, a church member. Um, they may just be going to the grocery store where someone is, as I was mentioning my own opening remarks, they may just go to the grocery store where someone who works in a long-term ca uh, long care setting also goes. And that is an opportunity for virus to spread. Um, and so we're trying to help everyone understand it's not just about your own personal risk. It's about what is the risk to our community members as a whole. And what we know in North Carolina is unfortunately more than half of us, 51% are either over the age of 65 or have a chronic disease that puts us at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19. So while you may say, oh, eh, if I get it, I'm not likely to get too sick. The issue is though, you may give it to others. Um, and that's why we all have to work together here it's why face coverings are so important. Um, we know that we can protect each other if we do that, but we do need folks who are younger to understand not just the risks to themselves, but the risks to their, their friends, their family, and to the rest of their community. And we'll take our final question today from Tina Terry at WSOC-TV Charlotte. Tina, you might be on mute. Tina's not there. Let's go to Travis Payne with WRAL. Travis with WRAL. There was a study out of Norway that's getting some attention today. Uh, they looked at people who returned to the gyms and people who didn't return to gyms uh, over two weeks and did not find increased risk for transmission. Uh, among the people who did return to gyms. Are you familiar with the study? Uh, should it inform our policy on reopening gyms, uh, particularly in areas that are not in particular hot spots in North Carolina? Thanks for that question. I did not read the study, but I did see an article that covered the study. I think the important part is that two weeks. So I, I think maybe some promising uh, information that I wanna learn more on, but, the, but two weeks is not enough time for us to have definitive information about uh, how to move forward here. What, what, I, what we have seen uh, is uh, events where um, when you have heavy breathing, uh, whether it's singing, shouting, or heavy exercising, and you have more particles dispersed from your mouth and your nose, that is how this virus spreads. Um, and that's, that's just uh, how our, the, the studies continue to, to move forward. And what you're seeing in some of our, the other states who are seeing surges in their cases, like I said, we're seeing increases, which is worrisome, but they're really seeing surges. You're seeing those states walk backwards uh, and, and close different activities. And the things that they close first, bars and then gyms. Um, and I think that's because they're looking at some of the same data that we're trying to look at of what are the higher uh, transmission activities um, that could be contributing to things. Now, I, I, like I said, I think that there are other things that are spreading virus here in North Carolina right now. Um, and we need to focus on those higher risk areas as well. Um, but we, we continue to see evidence um, that there is more viral spread with, with gyms. I think there are opportunities to, uh, for gyms to be uh, 
offering activities outside. I know that, that they are classes outside, equipment outside. Um, those are lower risk activities, right? So we want to get into a place where, there's, where, where you could be outside and moving around. Uh, those are what we want to focus on. So we'll still keep our eye on additional data. We know data is evolving on this. We continue to look at new data and we will, and we'll try to incorporate that into um, our thinking. I'd like to see that study run for a, a little bit longer than two weeks before we integrate that into um, uh, how we think about other easing of restrictions. And I would say that if we want to do further easing of restrictions in any, any uh, context, that we really all need to focus on uh, wearing a face covering, keeping this viral, viral spread low in all of our communities. And remember, top priority is also to get our kids back to school for in-person instruction. That's a top priority as well. So, thanks for that. OK, so I don't hear a follow up from Travis, so I'm happy to talk more offline with you, Travis, on that one. But just want to thank everyone again. I know we'll be back tomorrow with more information. Uh, and again, wear, wait, and wash. Stay well. Thank you.